Ukrainian ambassador to the UK has told LBC there are mixed signals about what Russia is planning to do next. Moscow claims some of its troops are returning to base after exercises on the border near Ukraine. And following discussions with the German Chancellor, President Putin says he's willing to continue dialogue. Vadim Pristaiko says he's hopeful of a peaceful outcome. I believe that the window for diplomatic solution is still open. At the same time, we see, you know, the, the mixing, sort of mixing set of signals, different ones. From one hand, they're talking that there is some resolution is here. From the other hand, Putin is telling that NATO hasn't responded to his request. In Ukraine, a number of government agencies and major banks have been hit by a cyber attack. Prince Andrew has reached an out-of-court settlement in the US with Virginia Dufresne, the woman who accused him of sexual assault. He's always denied any wrongdoing. Documents show he'll make a substantial donation to victims' charities. The coronavirus vaccine is going to be offered to all primary school-aged children in Wales. It'll be the first part of the UK to extend the programme to 5 to 11-year-olds. The family of a cinematographer accidentally shot and killed on a film set last year is suing Alec Baldwin and the movie's producers for wrongful death. The star had said he was pointing the gun at Helena Hutchins and it went off without him pulling the trigger. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed up 77 points at 76.08. The pound buys $1.35 and €1.19. LBC weather, rain tonight, gales on coasts in the southwest. Tomorrow, sunny spells before rain and gales move in. A high of 15 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Andy Ivey. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening and welcome to Tuesday's edition of Cross Question. This is a special edition because we're only taking calls on international issues. We've done this before and it proved incredibly popular. We have a great panel to answer your questions and if you do want to ask them a question, the number to call is 0345 6060 973. Joining me live from Washington is our Washington correspondent Simon Marks. Arthur Snell is a former British diplomat and host of the Doomsday Watch podcast. We'll find out more about that in just just a moment. Cindy Yu is broadcast editor at The Spectator and host of the Chinese Whispers podcast. And Mary Dajewski is foreign affairs columnist for The Independent and former foreign correspondent in Moscow, Paris and Washington who desperately needs a podcast of her own, I think, <laughs> I think, Mary. And do, do watch us on Global Player as well. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Now, I can see from the questions that are already coming in, they're mostly on Ukraine, and that's absolutely fine. We could spend the whole hour talking about Ukraine, and we, indeed we might do, but there are other issues in the world that we could talk about as well, if you want to, but you set the agenda. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first questioner. It's Alex in Watford. Hello, Alex. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel, and a special good evening to Simon Marks. What would oh, Winston Churchill... <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, most definitely. What would Winston Churchill do with Russia? Well, just for that, I'm going to go to Simon Marks first. <laughs> <laughs> Always the easy ones, Ian. Um, i tell you what, I think Winston Churchill probably would not have done uh, over the course of the last 24 hours, and that is... Uh, remove American diplomats and the embassy from Kiev and send it to Lviv in western Ukraine. I mean, we are in a slightly curious situation here where, again today, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has insisted that the United States has unwavering support for Ukraine, but this is the same Secretary of State uh, whose embassy in uh, Kiev, soon to be Lviv in western Ukraine, has no ambassador. Uh, and the same Secretary of State... Uh, from a country that over the weekend pulled out 160 members of the Florida National Guard who had been uh, training and advising uh, Ukrainian military personnel. So it's an interesting definition of unwavering support and one I suspect that Winston Churchill uh, would probably not have embraced. I mean, this is a Biden administration that has uh, been really constrained in its response to what's taking place uh, in both Moscow and in Kiev uh, by uh, the experience of Afghanistan last August. And I think there's absolutely no way you can uh, ignore the spectre of Afghanistan haunting uh, the corridors of Joe Biden's White House as you assess uh, his White House response to what's been taking place in Moscow and Kiev. Mary. 
Mm. Well, I absolutely agree with everything that has just been said because I think that the the way that the Western countries, but and especially the Americans and the British, have really scarpered from Ukraine over the last week is completely scandalous. And I'd put in a word here for President Zelensky of Ukraine, who has been an absolute model of equanimity and firmness and essentially kept his country... <laughs> in a degree of equilibrium, which in most countries I think would have been practically impossible with all these panic noises um, coming out of, uh, of Washington and London. That's a really London. good point, because I, I was talking to the Ukrainian ambassador earlier and I said, how come everyone that I talk to in Ukraine is so calm? Because, I mean, we certainly wouldn't be like that, I think, if we were under this level of threat. No, I mean, I, I, I think that um, Zelensky, you know, he, he's always been dismissed as a sort of novice politician, that he was a mere actor before he became president. He campaigned as a democratic politician. He won a landslide across Ukraine, which was an extraordinarily um, difficult thing to do in a country which has been traditionally divided. Um, and I think he's behaved as probably the most, um, the wisest and most moderate of all the politicians who've been dealing with this crisis. So I, you know, I want a word in there for President Zelensky. And I think if we go back to Churchill, then I think Churchill might have seen that and he might have not done, which most of the other world politicians have done through the Ukraine crisis, which is to ignore Ukraine. It's talked over Ukraine, it's talked past Ukraine, but actually considering Ukraine's own interests has hardly been done. And I also think that you know Churchill had rather um, uh, decided views about Russia, and he had this wonderful quote about um he sees Russia as, he doesn't really know what Russia thinks, but he sees it as, to summarise, a riddle wrapped in an enigma, etc. But what's often ignored about that, the quotation is never taken to its, uh, to, to its conclusion, because Churchill said, well, there is a key to the enigma. And what he saw as the key was Russia's national interest. And I would actually change that slightly and say that the key to what's going on at the moment in what a lot of people are saying is sort of inscrutable um, and at the same time threatening Russian behaviour is Russia's national security. And if you start from that perspective, then I think what's going on makes a lot more sense. Cindy, you. Well... Um, I'm not a Churchill expert, <laughs> um, and nor am I an you Ukrainian expert. You work for expert. the Spectator. I'd have thought it was part of the interview <laughs> process. How did you slip through? Yes, we don't ask for CVs, but we do ask for aptitude tests on Churchill. Um, no, uh, I think, you know, just to agree with what Simon and Mary have already said, you know, despite um, my outsider's perspective, it does seem like a lot of the ways in which America has dealt with this is not actually that convenient for the way that Ukrainians want this to be dealt, by which I mean President Zelensky or Ambassador Presterko. Both of them have said, you know, let's not panic, let's not, uh, you know, cause a capital flight within Ukraine, which is, of course, what's happened this week. Uh, there's a ban on commercial flights now, and, of course, President Zelensky has had to underwrite that with a $600 million package. So, you know, in some ways, Putin's already getting what he wants in destabilising Ukraine just from the American-led panic. Um, and so the question is, you know, is that it? Is there more to the strategy than just panicking? Or is the release of intelligence actually a strategic thing? Well, I'm not sure. I don't think we'll ever necessarily find out at this stage. Remember the slogan, keep calm and carry on, which was prevalent in the Second World War? At least I think it was. Or is that an urban myth? I don't know. We all, <laughs> we all see the postcards. Um, I mean, that was very much a hallmark of Churchill. I don't ever... I, I, I've read a lot of books on Churchill, watched a lot of documentaries. I don't ever see him having panicked. Yeah, and I think the British politicians have in our, you know, desire to be seen as global Britain, in our desire to prove to Biden that we're reliable allies, whether it's Boris Johnson or Liz Truss or Ben Wallace, have really succumbed to that um, hysteria. You know, Ben Wallace over the weekend calling it, likening it to Munich, you know, this, this appeasement of Hitler. I mean, it just seems, you know, we're well, not you, quite you, there yet. Well, you can, you can liken France's attitude and Germany's attitude to Russia being a little bit... Well, I don't think Russia's that, asking in return for a region to be parceled off is the only problem, right? I think that's right? exactly what they're asking for. No, I don't think... Well, not formally. Well, I mean, Mary will be able to they, tell they, us. But they, uh, hang on, hang on a second. They annexed Crimea. They have no, but they're not asking for that. I'm, I'm saying right now they're asking for Ukraine not to join NATO. That's my understanding. I mean, of course, Mary will be able to tell us more, but that's my understanding of their key ask. 
Okay, um, let's go to Arthur. Uh, well, I think going back to Churchill, um, it's probably worth remembering that at, at the end of the Second World War, he, of course, had a certain closeness to Stalin. I'm not suggesting that in, in any way, you know, they were ideologically aligned. Um, and yes, Churchill was quite tough with Stalin at the Yalta Conference and the sort of carve up of Europe. But of course, Churchill also uh, was prepared to, as it were, throw over those um, citizens of what was then the USSR, largely Cossacks and others who'd fought against the Soviet forces. And, and a lot of those people were returned to, to Soviet Russia and, and many uh, ended up in the Gulag. So um, we, we all rightly celebrate Churchill as a great war leader, but he was also someone who could be ruthless um, and, you know, had a very sort of pragmatic approach in carving up Europe at that time. So I'm not sure that uh, he would have any necessarily simple solutions to the problem we face today. Mary, do you want to respond to Cindy's point? Yes, no, I absolutely agree with Cindy. I don't think Putin wants any more territory. Um, Crimea was a one-off. He's one hiding off. it well. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not listening to what Putin is saying. Putin is saying that he that Russia is not going to invade Ukraine. And he's also said that he recognises an independent and sovereign Ukraine. There is no question of him taking territory from Ukraine. Crimea was a complete one-off. So, so and just, it's perpetually just seen why, why has he got as all a... these troops on the border? Why, why has he got half of his air force now sighted in Belarus just waiting for the, for the word go? Well, that's where you have to distinguish different things because what's going on in Belarus is long-standing annual joint manoeuvres, which they have practically every year. And that's why they're there. You don't need to link that with what's going on on the Ukrainian border. Why are the Russian troops on the border? How do we know there are that many Russian troops on the border? Do well, you... because we, ha we have the pictures from satellites and we have all the intelligence. And, I mean, also, he's supporting separatists in Ukraine. It, you seem to be making out that he's some sort of benevolent watcher over of the situation. Yes, it's but not you see, like that, you're, you're, you're talking about separatists as though... Putin is, is supporting a, a, a group in eastern Ukraine who want to separate that part of Ukraine off and join Russia. First of all, Putin has said time and again that Russia does not want to incorporate these, the, 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 these two regions. Second of all, the idea that they are actually breakaway separatists is highly questionable. What has been, what, the issue which is being fought over in eastern Ukraine is about um, autonomy, a degree of autonomy for those regions, what we call benevolently devolution. And devolution is what Kiev does not yeah, want to 14, give. 14,000 Ukrainian lives in that area have been lost in the last seven years. Yes, and if you... If you look at the closest parallel that I can see with what maybe we are more familiar with, you would be looking at Ireland a century ago because you're talking of something very similar there. And even the, the, the Northern Ireland provinces are almost exactly the same proportion of the island of Ireland as the regions in Ukraine. If you turn, it's very interesting, if you, if you turn a map of Ukraine um, on its side, the actual ratio is very similar to Ireland, and it's a very similar issue. It's about cultural separatism and recognition of a separate culture. And what's, what's happened in, in Ukraine is, as it were, the mirror image of what's happened in Ireland, in that, the, in that Northern Ireland is separate and is part of the UK. That part of Ukraine is what is what would have happened he, he, he if the Northern Ireland provinces give, had been part of. He didn't the, give Crimea of any option about being an independent part, being an independent part of Ukraine. He just annexed it. So, I mean, I, I would say the precedent Look, Crimea, was set there. Yes, but you are seeing it as a precedent. I'm seeing it as a one-off because Crimea is a very separate place. What about Georgia? It's, it's populated entirely by, but practically entirely by Russians and it has a gigantic military naval base at Sevastopol and my view is that in annexing Crimea that was at a, a time of extreme emergency in Ukraine when the government in Kiev had been toppled. Russia was worried about losing that base to Western forces. Well, it's not an extreme emergency now. Maybe he should hand it back. <laughs> <laughs> to whom? Well, I, I mean, the point is that he's got form. We know what happened in Georgia. 
we we know that he wants to create well at least i think we know maybe <laughs> not that that he wants to recreate a sort of greater russia maybe not the exact borders of the soviet union that would be impossible but he's very keen to do that and he sees Ukraine as part of this. Yes, but there are so many misreadings here that you're, you're, you're indulging in. One of them is that Putin's ambition in life is to reconstitute the Soviet Union or something like the Russian Empire. Not so. He is on the record dozens of times as saying no, not that, that that's not what he's about. And the idea that... You, so you take, Crimea, you, you take him at his word, do you? It's not a question of taking him at his word. It's looking at what he's done and how he's behaved. And when you single out Ukraine and you talk about uh, 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 Crimea and you talk about precedents, the, 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 the common argument in British and American diplomatic circles is to talk about a pattern of behaviour. And you go back to Georgia and mm. you talk about Crimea and then you mm. say next in line like is the Ukraine. 1930s. But those things are all separate. They're not the same. They're quite yeah, different. You, the reasons have, for them are quite I mean, different. I don't want to impute views on you that you don't hold, but if you go back to the 1930s... You, you <laughs> I could, don't. You, you, well, I know, I know you don't. I know you don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't meaning it in that way. But you could have said in 1936 when Hitler marched into the Rhineland, oh, well, that's just a one-off. And then when he went into Austria, oh, that's just a one-off. Then when he went into the Sudetenland, yeah, but that's different because why is it that there's always an excuse that we find for dictators? But you see, that's that, that, that's why I think, you know, the whiff of Munich that Ben Wallace was talking about oh, the weekend is wrong. so dangerous. I mean, that's incredibly seductive and incredibly wrong. Anyone else want to come back on this, um, Arthur? Well, I I certainly think your characterization of of those so-called separatist eastern provinces of Ukraine is is open to challenge. So a couple of points. One is that yes, there's there are people there who are native Russian speakers, and there are others who who would be native Ukrainian speakers. A lot of those have left as refugees, internally displaced people. As Ian mentioned, 14,000 people have died there. There is absolutely no doubt that these so-called separatists receive material support and also manpower support. Well, just today, yeah. the Russian Duma uh, sent a resolution Indeed. to Putin asking exactly. him to support the exactly. separatist states. Exactly. Now, they would have done that because he wanted them exactly. to. Exactly. No, that's, no, that's oh, is not that misreading true. it too? Because, because that, the, 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 that, that resolution passed by the Duma today has now gone to the Kremlin. We wait to see whether Putin is going to is going to sign it or not. Is there any and doubt you, in you that? say, is there any? There is doubt because okay. not signing it would send a certain signal. Simon, Ian, I can, I, can I? Can I? Can I? Yes, I mean, <laughs> fascinating though the future of Ukraine <laughs> is, and undoubtedly uh, paramount to all of this. Though the future of Ukraine is, there is a lot more about this dispute uh, from Vladimir Putin's perspective because he's talking extensively about rolling NATO back to the borders that NATO enjoyed in 1997. So he's mm. talking about saying goodbye to uh, the Baltic states participating. Uh, in NATO, for example. He That's wants a whole true. raft of <laughs> European security guarantees uh, that essentially would see him uh, enjoy, uh, he hopes, a larger sphere of influence uh, for Russia in what he does perceive to be uh, Russia's own backyard. So this is not simply about Ukrainian territory. It's about an effort by Moscow essentially to push NATO onto the back foot. And what I think he's succeeded. I mean, I think Vladimir Putin has succeeded in a whole variety of different ways over the last few weeks. The mere fact that you were having a conversation an hour ago with the ambassador uh, from Ukraine about whether it's possible now that Ukraine may actually come up with a way of saying, well, actually, we don't really want to be uh, members of NATO after all. That's a win for Putin. Uh, Putin uh, thrusting himself into the arms of Xi Jinping of China at this particular moment is is a big win for Putin, revealing uh, the American president to be weak and there to be very little unity among European allies, particularly when it comes to the harshest uh, sanctions that the Biden administration uh, says that it wants, uh, together with its allies and partners, to impose against uh, Russia. Those are all huge wins for Putin as things currently stand. OK, right. We have to go to a break. Really interesting discussion. We could go on for hours on this, mm. and we may do in a moment. It's 20 past eight. LBC. Turn
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 23 minutes past eight, it's uh, Tuesday's Cross Question, an international edition with Simon Marks, former diplomat Arthur Snell, uh, host of the Chinese Whispers podcast, Cindy Yu and Mary Dajewski, foreign affairs columnist for The Independent. Chinese Whispers podcast, mm. 30 second elevator pitch. Um, if you're bored of the Hong Kong stories, the Uyghur stories, everything else you hear in chi about China, Huawei, blah, 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 it's about everything else that the Chinese people are talking about, about the country, what matters to them, apart from these political hot potatoes in the West. And we'll do your podcast in about 10 minutes' time, Thank you. Arthur. Right, next question is from Mike in Beverly. Hello, Mike. Hi, Liam. Um, Hi. My question is, um, what does the panel think Putin's destiny would be if he went home with nothing, no diplomatic agreement from the West, NATO or Ukraine, and no territory. Arthur. Well, I think it's possible to say that Putin's already uh, banked some successes from this. So he's he's created this great threat and people are responding in certain ways. One of the ways is there's been a lot of talk about Nord Stream 2, this famous pipeline. Well, it now looks as though if Putin backs down, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would go ahead. Prior to this build-up, there was talk about whether it should go ahead anyway. So you could argue in that way that even if it looks to us like he hasn't won anything, he will be able to portray it as a gain to his people. Just, Simon, just on that, on the Nord Stream 2, Biden says that he'll put a stop to it. I mean, what's it got to do with Biden? How could he put a stop to it? Well, they keep intimating that they have some kind of a cunning plan up their sleeve, not <laughs> only to put sanctions back in place on the project, but uh, uh, they keep indicating that there's a plan uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, this was a source of huge tension between Biden and the new German Chancellor Olaf Scholz last week here. Olaf Scholz couldn't even bring himself to articulate the phrase Nord Stream 2, despite repeated attempts by German reporters uh, to get him to talk about it. And that's one of the strains in the transatlantic relationship that has absolutely already been revealed by all of this. So, uh, you know, in that sense, I, I agree with Arthur. I don't think there's any circumstance under which Putin goes home with nothing. He's already achieved something. And also, it's not clear to me that he ever really kind of goes home. I mean, this is not a president who, unlike his uh, counterpart in the White House there, has to worry about re-election or primary contests or any of that kind of stuff, uh, he, like Xi Jinping, can take the long view of all of this. And so it's not clear to me that there is an immediate moment on the horizon when we can all say, OK, well, I'm glad we got that done. That's all over. Mary. Well, I agree that P Putin has at least um, got some achievements in the bank, chief of which is actually getting noticed after being practically in ignored for the best part of half a year. So I think that is that is certainly an achievement. But I think that um, the way, assuming there's not going to be an invasion, the way this is going to be presented in Washington is going to be as a climb down for Putin. And I think we, we've seen a lot of preparations for that in basically presenting. The Americans have been acting as though they're presenting Putin with a choice. Either invade or you've got to retreat and you've got to be seen to retreat and it's going to look like a defeat. And I think that would have been a liability for Putin domestically, but not nearly as much of a liability as a war because a war is would be hugely unpopular in Russia. If there would be casualties, which I think it's pretty certain that Ukrainians would fight. And they've it got could some get, pretty powerful armed forces, yes, haven't they? Yes, it could get extremely nasty and there would be Russian casualties. And my view is that the, the greatest danger to Putin carrying on in power would be a nasty war in Ukraine. Cindy. Well, I think if they if Putin walked away without invading Ukraine, one other benefit to him would be that from Beijing they will sigh a breath of relief insofar as China is becoming Russia's closest ally um you know over over the last few years and it will continue to be over the next decade or so and actually, contrary to uh, received wisdom, China doesn't want a war in Ukraine because it's got investments there. Ukraine is actually part of the Belt and Road Initiative, so it would want, like to keep the peace. So if Putin walks away without any military intervention in the way that Mary's suggesting, you know, which would be very, very painful and dragged out, 
China will think, this is good for business and we can keep dealing with Russia. What, what about the idea that if Putin was successful in invading Ukraine and there was really no reaction from the West beyond the old bit of sanctions, wouldn't they take that as a green light to do the same thing with Taiwan? So it's obviously a theory that's been bounced around. Um, I would think I that... I thought it was being original. <laughs> no offence, Ian. Um, I would think that Beijing could take Taiwan whenever and however it wanted to. It wouldn't matter what Putin was doing on his Western front because, you know, China's not going to decide something so important based on what Putin is doing. Obviously, if it was a long and dragged out war, China might think that's a good opportunity, a timing-wise, mm. to do so. But it's not setting the precedent, I think. That's it, it's really interesting in that this parallel between Ukraine and Taiwan in that Ukrainians are incredibly incredibly calm at the moment, as we were talking about earlier. I remember when there was all that sort of um, slight kerfuffle a few months ago where people thought that China might be preparing to invade mm. Taiwan. Um, I was speaking to a friend of mine who is Taiwanese, lives there, and I said, what, what do you make of the current situation? And he said, what current situation? <laughs> I mean, just complete water off a duck's back. Very bizarre. Um, Simon, you, did you want to come back? No, I'm good. Carry on, as you were. OK. Well, let's just hear a little bit about um, Arthur's podcast then, The Doomsday Watch. Sounds like a fun podcast. Yeah, it's... Um, don't be put off by the name Doomsday Watch. Um, I think the best way to describe it is if you're uh, waking up this morning and thinking the world's gone crazy, uh, there's Ukraine, there's Taiwan, America's politics seem to be in a mess... Uh, you worry about well, the situation in the Middle East and, and climate change and all the rest of it. It's uh, ten episodes that tell you why it's all happening, why it's linked together, and why there's still hope. Um, oh, so not why we're all doomed. No, we're, we're, it has a happy ending. Excellent. Uh, that, that's what we like. Just about. Any podcast. <laughs> right, we will uh, take more of your calls in a moment on international affairs, 0345 6060 973. It's half past eight. Let's get the latest news headlines on LBC with Andy Ivey. The Duke of York and his accuser, Virginia Dufresne, have settled out of court in her civil sex assault claim, which she filed in the US. A court document says Prince Andrew regrets his association with Jeffrey Epstein and commends the bravery of Miss Dufresne and other survivors in standing up for themselves and others. Russia says it's withdrawing some troops from the border of Ukraine, but NATO says it's not seen evidence of that yet. The Kremlin failed to send a representative to a European security negotiation meeting today, and Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says Moscow needs to commit to meaningful talks. Wales's health minister says it's perplexing there have been delays to the publication of advice on Covid jabs for young children. It's become the first part of the UK to announce it's going ahead anyway and offering vaccinations to all 5 to 11-year-olds. LBC weather, rain tonight, gales on coasts in the southwest. Tomorrow, sunny spells before rain moves eastwards across most parts. Severe gales for central and northern areas, a high of 15 degrees. LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.34 on LBC. You're listening to or watching Cross Question. President Biden is making a live statement at the White House now. Let's just dip into that for a couple of minutes. World War II was a war of necessity. But if Russia attacks Ukraine, it would be a war of choice or a war without cause or reason. I say these things not to provoke, but to speak the truth, because the truth matters. Accountability matters. If Russia does invade in the days and weeks ahead, the human cost for Ukraine will be immense. And the strategic cost for Russia will also be immense. If Russia attacks Ukraine, it will be met with overwhelming international condemnation. The world will not forget that Russia chose needless death and destruction. Invading Ukraine will prove to be a self-inflicted wound. The United States and our allies and partners will respond decisively. The West is united and galvanized. Today, our NATO allies and the alliance is as unified and determined as it has ever been. And the source of our unbreakable strength continues to be the power, resilience, and universal appeal of our shared democratic values. Because this is about more than just Russia and Ukraine. It's about standing for what we believe in, for the future we want for our world, for liberty. We're, for liberty. we're going to play you more of that on the program after nine, because I think there were some quite significant things that Joe Biden was saying there just before we dipped in. Um, Mary and Arthur, you, you were watching on screen. We've got the, the sort of strap line of the, uh, the video printer thing underneath. So you saw one of the two of the things that he was saying. Arthur, do you want to just comment? Yeah, well, he seemed to be suggesting that there were um, changes that could be made. He talked about both NATO and Russia needing to change their approach, be more transparent. So although it's hard to say at this stage just from one speech, it looks as though the Americans might be about to try to make some kind of uh, sort of diplomatic gesture that may give an opening to Russia. Mary? Yes, it looked very much to me as though um, what we were looking at was an offer of um, talks at quite a high level um, about European and transatlantic security, um, which obviously would take into account quite a lot of the things that Russia was saying before Christmas when it presented two documents which were sort of draft treaties um, and some people regarded them as an ultimatum and other people said well they were basically an opening bid. It seems to me that um, President Biden has um, in a way responded to those documents which contained Russia's concerns about its security having been damaged by the expansion of NATO and that it wanted to to have talks about new security arrangements. What Joe Biden seemed to be saying was that the United States has accepted that there is a case for doing that and the US is prepared to engage in those talks. And if that is so, then I would say that Putin's won quite a big diplomatic victory there. Simon Marks. Yeah, Ian, I think the big takeaway came just before we actually dipped into that speech. At the beginning of it, Joe Biden said uh, that we should give diplomacy every chance to succeed. And I believe there are real ways to address our respective security concerns. Now, in this game of kind of ping pong paperwork that's been underway between Washington and Moscow that Mary was talking about there uh, over the last couple of weeks. Currently, it's the United States that is owed documentation uh, by the Russians. And Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, held a phone conversation with Sergei Lavrov, the, the Russian foreign minister, early today, in which the Russian foreign minister said that paperwork is going to be making its way to the United States at some point in the next week. And, and, and the Americans have been uh, clear since this all began, uh, that President Biden is willing uh, to see a conversation, uh, particularly on issues relating to uh, military deployments of weaponry by the United States on some of the, the fringes of NATO territory. And also, they've said here consistently that the United States and Russia have been able to work together, even at times of great tension in their relationship, uh, on uh, nuclear uh, negotiations. So definitely, though, 
those doors open uh, and some progress perhaps being made on the exchange of paperwork that may set the stage for what uh, the White House press secretary said earlier today could be further high level diplomacy, which could mean a face to face meeting with Vladimir Putin. Interesting that this has come on the night before the Americans predicted the invasion would take place, I, I guess. Maybe that's well, just coincidence. It, it, it did occur to me earlier today that uh, viewers uh, viewers and listeners of a certain vintage will remember Reginald Bosenket, uh, who used to be an, <laughs> a, a presenter on ITN. And his autobiography was entitled Let's Get Through Wednesday, uh, which I think <laughs> might be advice, advice that we can all heed. That's why we pay you the big bucks. Uh, Mary, you want to... Yes, I just wanted to add one note because one of the things I thought was so interesting about the quotations that um, Simon um, quoted was that he talked about... Uh, Biden talked about our respective security concerns. And one of the things that Russia has insisted on throughout is that it has security concerns of its own and it wants those recognised. And I think to talk about respective security concerns means that that particular um, aspect of what Putin's been talking about has been recognised. And if I were in Moscow, I would be putting a big red circle around that and an enormous tick to say that is huge progress. Well, as I say, we'll talk more about this after nine o'clock. Now, let's go to Shahid in Hamel Hempstead. I, I, actually, just before we do, Shahid, let me just reintroduce the panel because a lot of people will have been tuning in over the last few minutes. Uh, Simon Marks is with us, our Washington correspondent. Arthur Snell, former British diplomat and host of the Doomsday Watch podcast. Cindy Yu, broadcast editor at The Spectator and host of the Chinese Whispers podcast. And Mary Tajewski, foreign affairs columnist for The Independent. Shahid, fire away. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is the West especially, they've always been very selective and inconsistent in who they apply pressure and sanctions to. What is the panel's feelings on this generally? And do they think it's high time that the stances were changed from being inconsistent to consistent in who they punish and cripple with economic and military sanctions? Do you, do you have any anything in mind in that? Well, there's many countries that have been sanctioned, but um, let's look at my country of heritage, Pakistan. Uh, twice the Americans have punished them with massive sanctions. Once when um, the Afga uh, when, when the Russians were defeated in Afghanistan, um, the Americans decided to leave and decided to punish Pakistan for secretly building a nuclear bomb. Then when India tested nuclear bombs in 1998 and Pakistan felt they had to do the same, then the Americans put economic sanctions on. Just look to the north... Um, I don't want General Michel. Yeah, when General Michel took over, they got punished further. They got chucked out of the Commonwealth. Just look to the north, China. Um, never been sanctioned for not being a, a democracy, but look to Pakistan's west. Iran under heavy sanctions for not being a democracy. Well, Go a little bit further to the west, and all those other oil-rich countries, they get a pass. <laughs> Venezuela I mean, doesn't China, get a pass. Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe doesn't get a pass. <laughs> um, India China has get, had lots of economic sanctions put on it by certainly the Trump administration. I don't know whether they're still there. Um, Cindy, is it possible to be consistent in the application of sanctions? Sure, it's possible, but is it desirable? Probably not, because we have to think about why sanctions are coming into place. It's not um, really because America's some kind of school teacher marking the grades of every single person, if every single state in the world, and saying how democratic you are. Therefore, uh, you are, you know, exception to sanctions. And if you're not democratic, you get sanctions. It's completely for political reasons. You know, it's whatever helps um, the sanction placing country in order to put that in place. You know, China didn't get sanctioned for its nuclear weapons uh, thing because China was way too weak at the time in order to really matter. And, you know, when we look at British alliances, for example, with Saudi Arabia or with India, you know, it's not because of human rights that we're allies with them. It's because it makes sense geopolitically to be allies with those countries in those regions. And right now, for China, you know, as you say, the Trump administration was pretty tough on it during the trade war. And by the way, China didn't really, we found out recently, didn't really um, sign up to the side of the deal. So it hasn't actually bought those things that it said it would from America, which was part of the um, trade deal. China, it, you know, it... it it is suitable for the West to say that to criticise China for its certain, you know, for its human rights abuses. Uh, but, you know, we don't criticise other places for their human rights abuses if it suits us not to. So. OK, um, Arthur. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I agree with Cindy in that the consistency is, is not a feature. Um, 
a lot is to do with what's in our interest, but also to do with what's what's our power. Um, uh, it is it is easy for Britain to put sanctions on a small and distant poor country such as Zimbabwe, uh, and not easy for us to do that against a, a major trading partner. Uh, Shahid ha- makes a good point that it that there's a there's an inconsistency there. But of course, you know, if we were going to talk about Pakistan, just for example, that country has received billions of dollars in aid, both from the US and, and from other Western countries, including our own. So it's not a it's not a one way street. Mary? Well, I'm not sure about it not being a one-way street, but so often sanctions are merely a political gesture and they have almost zero effect, except on... You sounded like Margaret Thatcher now. <laughs> except on secondary countries. So when the, 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 um, the most recent sanctions were slapped onto Russia, um, what happens is that they, they, they don't really damage Russia. Russia has survived very well. Its agriculture sector has actually flourished um, by restricting imports under uh, under sanctions. But what's happened is that the countries which used to export agricultural goods to Russia have suffered hugely. And the British, who are often you know, gigantic cheerleaders for, um, for, for sanctions, have been very careful, especially when, when sanctions towards Russia are concerned. They have kept very successfully pretty much the whole energy and minerals sector where Britons are hugely invested have been exempted from practically all the sanctions which are imposed on Russia. All the sanctions damage practically everybody except the country which has been most vocal in advocating them. OK. Um, Simon, very briefly, if you could. Well, I think I think Shahid puts his finger on a, on, on a bigger issue uh, that, of which sanctions are merely one aspect, and that is the question about morality and consistency in foreign policy uh, more generally. I mean, uh, I suspect we can all remember the arguments that happened about whether it was right to sanction South Africa back in the 1980s, and clearly those sanctions played a substantial role in bringing the apartheid era uh, to its knees. On the other hand, sanctions imposed by Barack Obama against Russia after the Crimea annexation do not appear uh, really to have constrained Vladimir Putin's behaviour this time around. Uh, So I think it's part and parcel of a broader conversation about morality uh, in foreign policy that is uh, so often uh, clearly lacking, uh, that you you can't find consistency always in foreign policy, except the consistency that it's guided by, in the case of the United States, whichever American American president's personal definition of American national interest. More of your calls to come on LBC Cross Question. It's 8.47. This is LBC.
Boss Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 10 to 9 is the time. Simon Marks, Arthur Snell, Cindy Yu and Mary Tajewski with me answering your calls. Let's go to a text from Kerry in Portsmouth. Should the UK be taking part in the Winter Olympics in Beijing? Cindy, don't know why I'm coming to you first. Well, I think there are two ways of Have taking... Have you been using your podcast to talk about this? I did. Uh, yeah, I, d- I did look at this in one of the episodes, which is just basically why the Olympics is important to China, if at all, um, and also what impact any diplomatic boycott, which obviously the UK is doing, would have. And the conclusion was pretty much not very much impact at all, because what we want to do by not taking part is to show our displeasure at uh, human rights abuses within China. But frankly, the Chinese are not going to care about whether or not Boris is showing up in Beijing, and that's not going to be the be all and end all of what they do in Xinjiang. Um, So that's not had its desired impact. If indeed that was the desired impact, it obviously could just be signalling. But in terms of a you know, a sports boycott, I, you know, call me a wet liberal, but I would like to have a lot of people to people communication, sportsmen to sportsmen communication and exchange, even in a time when geopolitical tensions are running high. And I do think the Olympics is very good for that. So I I wouldn't want us, I wouldn't want to see a situation in which the West feels like China is so much of a persona non grata that it doesn't go and send any of its athletes to Beijing. Nobody's really watching the Olympics here because we haven't won a medal yet. That's what counts. Mary? Well, I think that Britain really, we, we've had the perfect solution because we've had a Team GB there and it's performed absolutely abysmally, probably <laughs> almost worse than in any Olympics, summer or winter, hitherto. Um, and the culmination seems to have been the crash of our two-man bobsleigh team, um, which is pretty dreadful. I don't think we've even won a medal in the curling, which at times people were, re- were really exercised about. So I think going but doing really, really badly has been a pretty good compromise. <laughs> Arthur? Well, um, it, it's, yeah, it hasn't, doesn't seem to be a particularly glorious event. And um, it's, I mean, the Winter Olympics, it's not really the real Olympics, is it? So um, I, I apologise to any Norwegians who are watching. Um, so I, 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 I think... Um, I think we've done it about right. You know, we, we haven't sent over all the royal family and our high-level people, but we've sent our slightly mid-level athletes and they've done their best and, and as others have noticed, probably will come back empty-handed. Mid-level has been kind, I think. Um, Simon Marks, is this a debate in America as to whether America should be taking part? Oh, yeah, absolutely. A big debate here in the United States. I mean, you had a number of Republicans lining up when President Biden was poised to announce the diplomatic boycott of the Olympics, saying that he wasn't going far enough and that it should be a full-scale boycott, that the uh, American athletes, disappointing though it would be to them, should be told, you're not going. And more than that, some of the Republicans wanted uh, legislation passed that would punish American sponsors uh, of the Olympics. I I mean, to to answer the question, that was posed, it seems to me that it, it, to, to get to a state a state where it's up to each individual country to decide if they're going to participate could largely be obviated if there was a different process for determining where the games are held every time they roll around. So in many ways, this is surely a question for the International Olympic Committee more than it should be a question for each individual government to make a decision. Um, let's move on to another question. It's from Mike in Dagenham. Um, he did phone this in, but he's not picking up the phone. I'm going to ask it anyway because it's quite a good one. With the situation in Canada, does the panel think that Justin Trudeau should be held responsible? This is all about the truckers' protests. He's introduced some well, fairly draconian measures to try and quell these protests. Mary? Yes, well, I was just saying that I saw a rather uh, w- w- what I thought was quite an effective remark this afternoon when um, Trudeau announced these emergency measures. And they were saying, well, if it was a country like Russia that was imposing these measures, then there would be huge protests around the world and all sorts of attacks, uh, verbal attacks on Russia. But because it's nice, kind, sensible um, Canada, every, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, Trudeau is going to get away with it. 
Uh, Simon, is this big news in the US as well? Yeah, well, he's not getting away with it on Canadian me uh, on conservative media <laughs> in the United States. I mean, these truckers in Canada have become absolute folk heroes for the right in the United <laughs> States. And, uh, you know, Fox News and the other right-wing news channels here are absolutely zeroing in on this move by Justin Trudeau, accusing him of hijacking civil liberties. I mean, we have all lived long enough to see two things over the last week. An American president, a former American president, uh, denying that he ever flushed presidential papers down a White House toilet, and Republicans in the United States finding something they really like and admire about Canada. <laughs> Who ever imagined we would live to see both of those things occurring? Um, Cindy, there's something you like and admire about Canada, isn't there? <laughs> Um, well, apart from the lovely weather and what I hear are very friendly people. Tell us what you said in the break. I was just saying in the break that, you know, it's always the attractive liberal sweetheart leaders like Justin Trudeau and Jacinda Ardern who are the most, you know, dictatorial sometimes. But, uh, I mean, Trudeau, I think, is an interesting character in that he is, I think he's more of a narcissist than Donald Trump was and, that, and that's saying something. I can something. see that, I can see that. Um, and, and he seems to come up smelling of roses time and time again just when you think that he's about to be knocked out of the political game. Um, but do you think he's overreached himself with these measures? I don't know, actually. I mean, I don't know enough about the public opinion in Canada, but if it's anything like what it is in the UK or New Zealand, a lot of the time these draconian measures are actually quite popular with people who, for whom this has become a culture wars. And maybe Simon's got a similar thing in America as well, where the tougher you are on COVID, the actually more popular you are with a certain population, part of the population. And actually, if you look at the opinion polls in this country, right. it, it was exactly the same thing, Well, 10pm curfew will be here. You look, at Twitter and, and the you, you look at Twitter and you think, oh, all of these restrictions are really unpopular. Then you look at the opinion polls, Exactly. And you realise that Twitter doesn't really stand for much. Arthur? Yeah, well, I certainly think, um, yeah, what everyone's view of Trudeau, th this is this trucker's uh, demo is being pushed by right-wing groups in America. In, in Canada, uh, vaccination has been overwhelmingly taken up by the population, just as it has here in the UK. There isn't really an anti-vax movement there. So I think Trudeau has a right... Uh, to be rather peeved that his increasingly uh, strange neighbouring country is sort of destabilising the situation inside his own country. Right, let's... Um, good text here from Neville. He says, Simon Marks is very intelligent and full of insights. Thank you, Ian, and the panellists. I think the other panellists have exhibited intelligence and insight too tonight. Simon, is it your, your brother? I've managed, to, I've managed to hoodwink another one. <laughs> right, um, our final text question is from Tony in Hackney. Earlier this year, there was great dismay when the four-metre sculpture of a giant potato in the Cypriot village of Xylophagu was cut down by vandals. What's your favourite unique global landmark? P.S. Good news, the potato has been <laughs> restored. But no news as to where it was found or how it was restored. Um, Simon Marks, um, I'd say my greatest la favourite landmark would be Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore, really? That's an yeah, interesting choice. Um, my favourite landmark. Uh, it's hard for me to uh, come up with a single favourite. I'll tell you one that we might uh, want to just keep an eye on. And that is the giant sculpture of tulips uh, that was presented to the people of Paris uh, by the American artist Jeff Koons as a uh, symbol of America's support after the Charlie Hebdo attacks and some of the other uh, attacks. This was overseen by the woman who has been nominated by President Biden to be the next U.S. ambassador to the Court of St. James. Uh, and it caused consternation in Paris with all sorts of lawmakers and artists and philosophers saying that they didn't like the sculpture and a search had to be made for a pavement strong enough to support it. One wonders what she might bestow on London by the time she uh, has finished up there. Goodness me. Mary? Well, I don't know whether it counts as a monument or not, but I would say St Basil's Cathedral in Red Square because I think that is a sort of global symbol of everything about Russia. It's exotic, it's solid, it's gilded domes. I think it's, um, it's if you like, the best side of Russia. I, I would agree with you on that. I saw that as a 13-year-old and it mm. took my breath away. You're absolutely right. Um, Arthur? Um, well, it... 
hard to pick one thing, but I think what I'm going to say is there's a city in Yemen in the desert called Shibam, where most amazing architecture are skyscrapers built from mud, which seems impossible, but they're there. And I think a lot of people associate Yemen with tragedy and warfare and starvation and so on. Uh, but it's also a city with amazing history, culture and uh, I like to believe that at some point in the future, people will be able to go back there to visit. Cindy? Slightly different one, not necessarily a favourite, but certainly very unique, is Turkmenistan's falcon-shaped airport. So Turkmenistan doesn't get much international travel. Despite that, the president wanted an airport that looked like a bird, and he got it. (laughs) I should have to visit. (laughs) That would be be rather good. Uh, Final text. Ian, your panellists were disrespectful to our Winter Olympians. They are Olympians who've worked extremely hard to get to Beijing and deserve our full backing. Well, you've all been told there. Simon Marks, Arthur Snell, Mary Tijewski, Cindy Yu, thank you very much for joining us on Cross Question. We'll do it all again tomorrow night at 8. Coming up in a moment, we'll be talking more about Ukraine. President Biden has been giving a press conference. We'll play you a section of that and then we'll get your uh, reaction and we're going to talk about Prince Andrew and Virginia Geoffrey as well. It's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC.